Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the global webinar series this evening. I am Swami from the Center for Expression Learning at SSS, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. We are privileged to have Malan Palaran Jr., a registered medical technologist from the Philippine Red Cross. She has been with the Philippine Red Cross for six years. Since March last year, she has been deployed to 12 different provinces across the Philippines to set up remote labs for COVID-19 testing. So this evening, he will share about his first-hand experiences as well as challenges faced on the ground. So let's hear how life has changed for him combating the virus at the front line. To all our audience this evening, if you have any questions, do remember to send them using the Q&A button on this Zoom webinar program. Marlon, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Su. And again, welcome. Good evening to everyone. Welcome to the global webinar series in the fight against COVID-19, a humanitarian view in the Philippines. In this session, our discussions will focus more and mainly on the pre-pandemic situation of the Philippines or in the Philippines, inside the molecular laboratory, the challenges of COVID-19 testing in the Philippines, the deployments in different provincial laboratories, and the efforts made by the Philippine Red Cross in ending this COVID-19 pandemic. So to start with, I'd like to give you a view of how I actually entered the Philippine Red Cross, this lar the largest humanitarian organization in the country. It was actually on May 1, 2013, very significant because it was a national holiday in the Philippines, it's Labor Day, when I was hired officially by the Philippine Red Cross General Santos City. And today, I am and been involved in the organization for more than seven years now. I It was also very significant for me the interview day because it was during my birthday, April 24, I turned 23 that year. And so that was it. And then the main function of a medical technologist in the Philippine Red Cross is number one is the donor recruitment office. So I held the position from the start of my career in the Philippine Red Cross. It's more of like the promotion of the voluntary blood donation and at the same time, the establishment of the pool of donors and to educate the youth, the young, and then the young at hearts on the importance of the donation and the significance it makes on the lives of those who will receive the blood. Also, it is part of our tour of duty to do the serological testing for the collected blood or the collected units for five transmission, transmissible infections, namely the human immunovirus or the HIV, the hepatitis B, hepatitis C, syphilis, and of course, the malaria, which is pre prevalent in the Philippines. Also, we do the blood banking in which we do component preparation and separation, blood typing, and also phlebotomy, the collection of blood for from our blood donors. Okay. So these are the pictures. These are some of the pictures of my journey in the Philippine Red Cross General Santos City. So I stayed there for six years before I moved to the national headquarters. And then annually, we also do the recognition for all our donors, blood donors and the sponsors. During my volunteer works also in Red Cross, I actually resigned at Philippine Red Cross General Santa City last July 15, if my memory serves me right, for I was having, you know, trouble with <laughs> professional idol. So during those times, I volunteered for the Philippine Red Cross in the vaccination of rural areas in different parts of General Santa City and Sarangani Province for polio vaccine. This is actually in partnership with the Rotary Club and the local government unit of the said provinces and city. So it took us 
three weeks in operation because if you don't know, Philippine Red Cross actually was very also involved in the community service, especially with vaccinations and relief operations during disasters, either man-made or natural forms. So we have these health services which caters the needs for, for nursing care and vaccinations too. So my journey ended actually uh, with a great heart because I was in communion with my colleagues. Just to give you a good run through, it was in March 15 to 17, 2020, when we had our training, formal training at the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine for molecular laboratory uh, procedures for COVID-19 testing. So it was after that, that the Red Cross established its first molecular laboratory in the mezzanine. So basically what we do inside the laboratory is that after receiving, uh, no, no, first is the specimen collection, which is conducted by our nurses. And then they do the oral, oropharyngeal and then the nasopharyngeal swabs. After that is that they send the specimen to the laboratory for us to process. So the first stage of the process is the receiving in which we use our platform, the C19 platform. It's the most advanced laboratory information system in the country as to date. And after receiving, we inactivate the sample. And then after inactivation, uh, inactivation actually happens uh, in 10 minutes for each UTM for 65 degrees Celsius. So we place them in a heating block. So I'm gonna show you a picture. So this is the reagent preparation. So this one, the video that I am doing is that I am, I am inactivating the specimen so that the content can be workable, just so in case that there are viral contents inside. So it has to be inactivated first before processing to make sure and to increase also the, I don't know, the, the mitigation measures in the transmission of disease. So it's a way for us to be secured inside the laboratory. Also, our facility, is in negative pressure. So everything that comes out is just in a unidirectional in, or in one way. Also, it has HEPA filter, which filters all the air before it is released to the environment, which is safe for the humans and other living organisms. And then the second procedure after inactivation is the removal of swabs. And then after the removal of swabs is we do the extraction. The extraction actually is a procedure in which the content of the UTM or the universal transport media where the swabs is placed or are placed is being exposed, the genetic materials being exposed into the, the solution. And the covering are removed, especially the impurities for us to process it well and to add up the enzymes and also the PCR mix. So this is the process. So basically we are using fully automated RNA extractor. So human interventions is more of the arrangement of the samples and then the loading of the reagents. Going back, this is the reagent preparation where we prepare the reagents is separated. Every step of the way is actually separated in, in secluded in a separate room. So if you do reagent preparation, that is the only thing that you do for the whole day with the PPEs that you wear. And if you do receiving, that's the thing that you do for the whole day with PPEs also. This is to increase, of course, our mitigation in the transmission of the virus for us to get detected. Okay. So testing, these are the challenges that we have in the Philippines. Since we know for a fact that if we base on the world map, the Philippines is actually an archipelago, which is comprised of 7,107 islands with three major islands, the Luzon, Visayas, and then the Mindanao. So the most challenging part is actually to transport the equipments, which are so big, and then 
also the, the, the people, the operators, the trainers pass on at different locations. If you can see during the pandemic, we actually asked help from the government to mobilize our equipments and us also for the testing training since we have to set up different molecular laboratories in the country. So we have to move the equipments and also the, the people. On the first picture is one of the military planes that we boarded. And on the second picture is actually a cargo vessel since there are no available flights and there are no available commercial boats to transfer us from one place to the other. Okay, so this is actually the best experience in training provincial laboratories. What happened was in every local government units, there is actually a policy on its ECQ, the, uh, the enhanced, uh, in, enhanced community quarantine or lockdowns. So basically, it differs from one from one local government unit to the other. So I will be showing to you a video of the pre-departure announcement of the cabin crew because I was the only passenger in this vessel. That is because uh, the the locality has declared a lockdown, and I have to move from to move out from there so that I will not be you know, locked down there for 14 days. So this is actually the actual video of the pre-departure announcement. We are here to ensure your safety and comfort during the flight because we ask that you assist us by serving high standard of personal hygiene, face masks must be worn at all times, and hands must be washed or sanitized frequently. If you are here to symptoms such as fever, cap, and short neck of breath, have you identified the call? If you have seen, I was the only passenger on that aircraft because it was actually requested by the Philippine Red Cross to move me out from that place to the to be back in Manila. So this was the video of the plane. It didn't actually happen once, it happened many times, three times in fact, where I was the only person on board. So this was the inside of the military plane. Just to give you an idea, Philippine Red Cross actually is testing 20, up to date, we are testing 21.4% of the total testing capacity of the Philippines since the, the, the total tested of the Philippines, for, this is for all, the, for all the private and public molecular laboratories, we tested 8.4 million people and then 1.8 million of that is from the Philippine Red Cross. So the total population of the Philippines now is 111 million. We have 13 molecular laboratories spread all throughout the country. We have three in the national capital region, which is in Mandalay. We have two, the Philippine Red Cross Tower mezzanine with a capacity of 4,000 and the Philippine Red Cross Logistics and Multipurpose Center with the same capacity of 4,000 tests per 24 hours. We are also operating 24 hours. And in the port area, the largest molecular laboratory in the country and in Philippine Red Cross, it can process for about 14,000 tests per 24 hours. It's located in Metro Manila, I mean in Manila, the national capital of the Philippines. Also, we have laboratories in Clark, in Batangas, in Subic, Cebu, Bacolod, Iloilo, and in Mindanao, we have Cagayan de Oro, we have uh, Surigao, and then we also have, um, uh, the last one that, that we have is uh, the, the Sambuanga City. And then we're planning to put up the 14th molecular laboratory in Cotabato City. So, so that's it. Those are the provinces that I have set up their laboratories too. And on the picture is actually the port area molecular laboratory.
Mercury lobby. The mezzanine actually uh, opened up, Philippine Red Cross mezzanine opened last April 4, 2020. And then it was followed by uh, the PLMC or the, the Logistics and Multipurpose Center in April 24, 2020, which is the date of my birthday. I turned 24, uh, yeah, 20, no, I turned 30 actually. And then on June 26 to July 6, I went to Cebu to set up their molecular laboratory, the first outside of the zone. And then on July 8 to 18, I went to Bacolod to set up the molecular laboratory also. And during the setup, what we do is that we check the layout. And then after checking the layout, we train the medical technologist or the analyst for the testing. And then we assist them during the proficiency testing given by the National Reference Laboratory. So after passing, what happens is that they will be given a license to operate to start with the testing. Also in July 21 to January 31, recently, I was deployed in Port Carriaman in the largest laboratory in the country for COVID-19 testing. And in August of 22 to 27, I went back to Bacolod for another round of supervision for the actual operation. And then on November 1919, we went to Iloilo, the third molecular laboratory in the Visayas to set up. And on December 26 to 30, we went there to assist them on their first week of operations. Also on February 1 to 6, 2021, we were sent to Zamboanga to train them with the saliva testing. It was actually a simultaneous training for all the provincial molecular laboratories outside Luzon. That includes the Cebu City, Bacolod City, Iloilo, Zamboanga, Cagayan de Oro, and Surigao. Just to give you a, a, a brief timeline of the COVID-19, in December of 2019, WHO China country office was informed of a pneumonia-like disease spreading in Wuhan City, Hubei province of China. In January of 2020, it was identified as the novel coronavirus, which was later renamed into SARS-CoV-2 or the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome 2, which is a causative agent for COVID-19. Same year that the genetic sequence was released and shared by the China for the detection kits. So it was only in January where the kits were available for testing COVID-19. The problem in the Philippines that year and that month of January is that the situation was very out of hand. That is because we were also experiencing the wrath of the Al volcano eruption. So what happened is that we had a difficulty in the lack of supply and to look for surgical masks or the mass or any covering for us to protect ourselves from the ashes of the eruption and at the same time, the incoming invasion of the coronavirus. So in January of 30, 2020, the first case of COVID confirmed positive was confined at San Lazaro Hospital. And then in February 1, 2020, same year, if I'm not mistaken, the first case of death in COVID-19. That was from a 48-year-old male Chinese citizen and the first in record in the history of the world and this whole pandemic thing. Okay. So the positivity, the current positivity rate of the Philippines is 7.8%, very high as compared to other countries, the new countries. So these are the pictures, the clear pictures of the places I've been to. So the three arrow shows Manila and then the three circles, the four circles are the places I personally visit to inspect. And then as you can see, the Philippines has a very unique uh, shape when it comes to its geographical location also. Because as I have mentioned, it's an archipelago. So it is comprised of 7,107 islands 
So mo mobilization of our equipment, which is very heavy, and then transport of, of, of the trailers is very hard also. So we have to ride a boat sometimes or to use uh, airplanes and vehicles to move from one place to the other to train. So these are the pictures. The first on your left, upper left, is actually the actual training in Cebu City, the first molecular lab outside Luzon. So we have a representative from Sancho Biotechnology from China who actually went personally to start with the formal training of the operation of the machine. And on the lower center, that is the time that we were deployed to Surigao and um, I think this is in Iloilo, if I'm not mistaken. So this was to supervise the first week of their operations. And on your right, the upper left, upper right, that are that is the uh, those are the people in Bacolod City that we have trained, the, the medical technologists, the analysts in the laboratory who will be conducting the COVID-19 testing. So this was in February 1. We were sent simultaneously uh, for six provinces outside of Los Santos to train for saliva. So the, there are representatives to different provinces. And on your, the leftmost, they will be sent to Bacolod City, the first two guys, Aldrin, the laboratory supervisor, and then Chill, the team leader in Port Area. Also, the next persons were Jaja and Kim, which were sent to Cagayan de Oro, and then followed by Charm and Kate, which, was, which were sent to Cebu City. And then that's me in the center, and Ryle, who were sent to Sambonga, and then Sir, Ra Sir Leonard, and then Simon, which were sent to Surigao, and then Alvin, and Sangda, and was sent to Iloilo to train for Salaiba. So this is actually a picture of the lobby of our molecular laboratory in the port area. All in all, we have 150, 140 to 150 medical technologists who's working in the port area Manila. And then we have 42 to 48 medical technologists who's working in the mezzanine, 42 to 48 also in the PLMC. And for each provincial laboratories, with a capacity of 2,000 tests per day, they have at least 24 medical technologists who's doing the tests for a 24 hours operation. So that was the picture of the PLMC laboratory. It's located at the back of the Philippine Red Cross Tower. This was the second to be established laboratory of Philippine Red Cross in Mandaluyo, Metro Manila. The next picture on your upper left is actually a, a, the laboratory of the Philippine Red Cross in Iloilo, Pasi chapter. So it was situated in Pasi chapter, not in the city itself, because Pasi is actually the center and the heart of the whole Panay Island. So it's accessible to all the, re the, the districts of Panay Island. So it covers the whole Panay Island testing. If you can see on the map, that's it. It was encircled with orange, the Panay. So that's the whole island of Panay. It also includes the Boracay, very popular tourist destination. And on the lowermost right is the picture of the pathologist and the representative from the DOHO. Philippine Red Cross in, I mean, the Region 9. This is in Sambonga during the saliva training. So the initiatives and efforts made by the Philippine Red Cross were actually the saliva RT-PCR testing. And to give you the timeline, it was in September of 2021, we started the study on saliva testing. And then it was actually in partnership with the University of the Philippines and then the Illinois University, Yale University. And in 
the result was actually very promising in the concordance reached for about 98%. So meaning the agreements of the results of the swabs and the saliva reached up to 98% with the same testing platform, the reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. So in January of 2021, the pilot testing was started for about 1,000 individuals, random individuals, for free, actually. So they, they get swab and then they also have to donate or submit the saliva. In February 1 of 2021, we had the provincial training, the picture that I show you. So it was six provinces with 12 medical technologists coming from the supervisors up to the team leaders to train them for saliva. And on October 6, 2020, Philippine Red Cross has marked its first, I don't know, has marked its 1 million tests for COVID-19. So here, I'm gonna show this. So before I end my, my talk, I'd like to, before I end the session, I would like to post awareness to everyone that we are not only battling the virus causing this pandemic. Remember that you are not alone and that we should always take into consideration the people around us because the moment we stop caring for each other, then that is the time that we lose humanity. All of my social media accounts are actually always sunny and bright because as much as possible, I would like to affect everyone in a positive way. In August of 2020, I actually lost my closest cousin, my number one comforter, my confidant, and my childhood best friend to her battle with depression. It was the lowest part, point of my life. So I picked myself up and though it hurts me a lot, but Many are depending on what I do. And so I was actually this, I, I'd like to share this uh, to you, the, the, the homily of Pope Francis in the Pentecost Mass in St. Petersburg Basilica during, I think if I'm not mistaken, it was on May 17. So he said that what we should avoid during this pandemic is narcissism, pessimism, and victimhood. Narcissism for if you think that you are perfect, then nothing will be filled unto you. So no, no space for, for improvements, no space for anything. And pessimism, pessimism because we are actually having a negative world right now, especially with the pandemic going on, the lockdowns. I actually had also to go through depression. So it was hard, but we have to look into the bright side. We have to look into the positive side and also, the last thing that he said was, we have to avoid being victimhood because if we consider ourselves as the only victim in this pandemic, as the only victim in this, uh, in this whole thing, in this whole process, then what happens is that you will develop anxiety, you will develop depression. So you always have to look on to the brighter side. So that ends my pandemic and I hope you like my, my session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam, for your sharing and also your positive spirit despite the challenges faced. I think um, many of us here are moved by the courageous effort and commitment by you and your team in this long battle against COVID-19. So now we will move to the Q&A segment. So uh, reminder to all attendees here. So if you have any questions, do drop them in the Q&A function below. So we have three questions from Rihua. Thank you for the question. So for her first question, she was asking whether the services that your team offers is cost a lot of money. So does the economic factor play a part in deciding um, how wide your 
communities outreach in terms of setting up the lab. So maybe is there any like sort of like consideration in terms of which areas that you and your team want to reach out to? So maybe you can share more about that. Yeah. Yeah, actually, during the start of the pandemic, what happened was business were closed. All the businesses were closed or the, all the non-essential businesses were closed. So what was technically open during that time are the groceries, which provides for the basic needs. And then, so the problem was a lot of our sponsors were also hesitant and has reservations when it comes to helping us. So there are brave ones who actually stepped out and donated a lot of you know, resources to us. There are some companies who have donated the renovation costs and some companies who have actually uh, contributed to the purchasing of these equipment. And also there are more uh, forwarding companies who also step up in, you know, in having us free transportation of the equipments from China towards here because most of our equipments and uh, the consumables, their agents came from China. So I think the most challenging part was actually to look for a sponsor in the times of pandemic. Though there are a lot of golden hearted here in the Philippines, but those are the challenges that we have to face too. And also the resources is not overflowing during that time. So I think the resources actually more of, or I mean, most of the resources came from the donations and at the same time, you know, since we are a humanitarian and voluntary organization, so we can actually receive donations. So most of the most of the resources came from donations and at the same time, the personal personal funds that the organization has reached over the time. Okay, so yeah, one year into the pandemic and also your like deployment by the Philippine Red Cross. So in terms of like contribution from companies or personal contribution, do you, up till now, do you see like there's a still a continuous flow of donations or is decreasing because after one year, yeah. Come again. Um, do you see, do you see like as of now, one year after the pandemic, is there is there a decreasing amount of donations from the people or the companies that donated as compared to actually, the start of last year? Yeah, actually the local donations really decreased but the international donations has, has stepped up. So I think it compensated the, the balance between the resources. Also, I saw a question, is this, is this what I should answer? The B, from, yes. question from B1? Yes. In which, she asked if setting up such laboratory requires mm -hmm. a lot of regulatory assessment. Actually, it does, it does, because it is a biosafety level two laboratory with special functions. So it has to grow, go through a lot of engineering, engineering requirements, also with, with the control in, 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 in everything in it, the process, and then the skills of the medical technologies you have to, to undergo trainings before, the, the operation has to start or has to commence. And then what happened was there was a problem in the transport of those uh, separate assessment body because commercial flights are not available yet. So they have to ask help from the military also. And uh, if, as I have mentioned, the Philippines is an archipelago. So it doesn't actually, you know, it, it, it's not like, a smooth ride from one place to the other. Sometimes yeah. you have to ride a two hours plane, and then when you when you arrive there, you have to ride a to have you have to ride a boat. Let's say two hours boat ride to go to a, to a place, and then from there you have to ride again another another land vehicle for about an hour. So it takes so much time and you know effort to be on a place a secluded place. Yes, and you have been to 12 different provinces to set up 13 labs. So I guess each province has its own logistic challenges and internal transport. So it must be a really challenging journey for you and your team. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like also to answer the question of same person, Biwalo, 
in which he, he or she asked that, does the population display a basis player mm. attitude towards COVID-19 measures like what we see in the Western mm. countries? Actually, the problem in the Philippines is that, as I have said, uh, it's an archipelago, so you will expect, a actually the Philippines has different dialects and, you know, we have a national language which is uh, Filipino or Tagalog, but there's a lot of dialects in the Philippines. So the problem with that also is that we Filipinos have different mentalities and, you know, a, a condition of mind. So there are some places in which they don't have strict implementation of Mm. the physical distancing, the, you know, the minimum yeah. protocols, and then the wearing of masks and things like that. So that is actually the most challenging part because you cannot please everyone. And especially with a different, you know, a, a different, a different island. I mean, from, a, from an island to an island. So, I mean, an island mm -hmm. from here is different from island there. So, the challenging part is on how you enter into them and inculcate into them the education process of the transmission of the disease, and at the same time, on how you, you know, incorporate uh, how you how you explain to them the minimum safety protocols. Because so even for now, even for now, some doesn't believe that COVID exists. So that is the big challenge. So when you say that, is it because of lack of or lack of access to information or the news, or does you and your team see any cause for that matter? Yeah. No, I think the access of information is quite okay with some islands or for the most of the islands, but the problem is the mentality of the people there because, you know, some are to cease to believe. So they have to see it, they have to feel it, they have to, yeah. you know, hear, they, they just don't want to hear it from, from a professional and professional health workers. They'd like to experience it firsthand so that they can share their experiences. So it's like that. So that's a big challenge actually. So in terms of testing, do you, does your team uh, face a lot of reluctant villages or people who don't want to be tested? Does your yeah. Yes, actually, in our statistics in, in far-flung areas and then in far provinces, there are lesser persons who get tested and some of them are actually forced by the government to get tested if they develop a symptoms. So it is only by then that they get tested and they, you know, they are detected with or having the virus. But the problem is it already spread in their family. It already spread in their neighborhood. So that's one thing that we, you know, we think is the most challenging part. Uh, okay. So yeah, let's move to the next question. We have quite a number of questions. So um, next question is by Pei Bing Gay. So her question is, for all the lab that you set up in the province, do they belong to the Philippine Red Cross or the Philippine Red Cross um, set it up and it will be handed over to a private or government agency? No, actually, in all of the 13 molecular laboratories that I set, uh, that the Philippine Red Cross has set up, is that people who work there are actually also from the Philippine Red Cross. They are Red Cross hired to do the testing. And just to give an idea, I think if I'm not mistaken, we are all 138 chapters in different regions of the Philippines. So in each chapter, there are persons who have been hired by the Philippine Red Cross to, you know, to continue with the programs of the Red Cross in the voluntary blood donation and at the same time in the disaster response. So I think uh, after, I, 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 after we set up the laboratory, we do not actually hand it over to a different organization or to a different company. We, the Philippine Red Cross, the national headquarters manage it all. That is why we have a central office here in Mandaluyo to cover all the 13 molecular laboratories. Okay. So it's all solely of Philippine Red Cross. And yeah. the services reaches from the tip to tip of the Philippines. Okay, so 
the next question, I think it's more scientific. Maybe you are able yeah, to answer, yeah. I'm not sure. So if someone be positive for COVID-19, is it true that they will still be positive in three to six months time? See, three to six months time. So how is it possible that other, how is it possible that others test negative? Mm. Come again. Okay, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you answer the first part of the question first, yeah. What, what was the first question? If someone yeah. has been tested positive in COVID, how true is that, that they will still positive in three to six months time? How is it possible that others test negative already after quarantine period? Well, actually, this is what happens. Okay, When you tested positive, you tested positive for the RT-PCR. That is the, that is the, the one thing that we recognize in the health industry. So it's the gold standard for testing the reverse, transcript the reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. It means that there was a COVID, a SARS-CoV-2 or a virus detected in your system. So it is through NPS, OPS, or saliva. You will test positive for that specific time. And then after quarantine, there are cases in which after the 14 days quarantine, you, you tested negative. That is because the virus has left your system. Now, there are some people who tested positive for RT-PCR still. That is because the virus maybe has been inactivated or has been destroyed already by your system, but is still present. So what is detected in the RT-PCR is the genetic material. So there are some people also who test positive for three to six months after they left the quarantine facility. That is for the antibodies. Because after testing positive for the virus, you will develop an antibodies. These antibodies are registry or register a registry of your of your past infections. So this past infections doesn't go uh, fast, doesn't go down fast. Okay. In some cases, it goes down fast because it is actually a response of our body towards the virus. So it depends on the immune system of the person. So sometimes it goes down quickly, sometimes it goes down slowly. It depends actually. So that three to six months positivity happens to the antibody testing and not on the RT-PCR testing, which is the detection of the genetic material. Yeah, it is a long matter indeed. I think we share some cases whereby um, patients with COVID-19 who has recovered will get COVID again in a few months' time. So I guess it's, it's yeah, really a long... It can yeah. be possible. Yeah, it is possible. Yeah, it can be possible. It is possible that if you get infected today and then you recovered after 14 days and then you went out of the public, you actually contracted the disease again and you turned out to be positive again. It is very possible. Especially that if your immune system didn't develop an antibody towards it because, you know, it's not that good, your immune system. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly. Because in vaccination process, actually, what happens is that we are actually introducing the messenger RNA for your body to develop an antibody. That antibody will protect you, supposedly protect you from getting infected because it has registered in your system that this one is foreigner, so we have to attack them. We have to resolve this problem immediately because it was, re it was previously registered by vaccination. So that's it. Since you talk about vaccination, maybe I can uh, jump in to ask about, um, in terms of vaccination, we know that in the Philippines, the supply is not that ready yet for the masses. So, um, when possibly in a few months' time when the vaccine are ready in the Philippines, um, the, the Philippine crop plan to play an active role in terms of setting up um, like vaccination centers for across the Philippines and does that pose another like maybe logistical challenge because the labs that you use may not be, it's only for testing, but you will need a new type of facility let's say if it be the cross one to be on the forefront of vaccination efforts yeah actually the philippine red cross is offers multi different multi services so we have this health services com comprised by nurses who do vaccinations 
So right now we are forecasting the 134 chapters. If they can, you know, provide us with a list of the number of volunteers that will be participating in the vaccination. Actually, our volunteers are very active, and so they respond to that. And then we plan to have the. Oops, I think we lost Marlon there. Marlon, can you hear? Can you hear me? The, sorry, sorry, we lost you for the five for the past five to 10 seconds, yeah. Now, now it's okay. Yeah, I think your internet connection was a bit um, interrupted for the past 10 seconds, yeah. Now it's fine, yeah, okay. you can continue. So, yeah, the, yeah Red, Cross is, uh, Red Cross actually offers also health services comprised of nurses which do vaccination. So what we do is we have this master listing of the, uh, the hired, nurses of Philippine nurses and also the volunteer nurses around the area to conduct vaccination if ever there's need for augmentation in the vaccination as to the need for you know to increase the vaccine vaccinators okay thanks for sharing okay we have another question um i think it's regarding the transportation because i think you you, you were saying that um you were traveling by by flights, so you, um, Philippine Red Cross engage um the help of the military for flights to some provinces. So in terms of arranging that, um, is there a lot of coordination and a lot of approval, uh, a lot of um wait approval time needed for all that the government play and uh at this point in in shortening the process time to get um the maybe approval and the necessary co coordination approved. No, actually, we don't have uh, that much of a problem because sometimes we only need to have at least two weeks notice to the government that we would like to request for a flight for the following person to mobilize them and to train or maybe to visit the laboratory. So there has no problem with that, with the coordination of the government. Actually, they facilitate most of our flights so that we can move to areas with you know no flights for commercials. Mm -hmm. The next question maybe is more of your personal personal um, comment or feedback regarding things generally shared about how the people in the rural areas are not believing about the existence of COVID-19. And now with social media um, and there's a lot of fake news. So in a way, in general, the news from social media kind of like downplay the seriousness of COVID-19. So um, yeah, maybe what's your personal personal feedback on that? Yeah. For people who, who think that COVID-19 is not that, or never even exists or not that serious. Yeah. Yeah, I think actually, because we have, uh, the news platforms in the Philippines are more of on social media. So the, the, different, the Philippine Daily Inquirer, the ABS-CBN News, and then the GMA News is more of, in active in social media. So most of the comments I see is actually against the concept of, you know, the truthfulness of the COVID-19 existence of COVID-19. So I believe social media plays a very important role actually in the spreading of the meaningful information of the virus. And also maybe that people for the longest time has been very saturated and so burnt out with the news on COVID-19 and things like that. So maybe what happened is that they became more complacent when it comes to news and less receptive about it. So most of them doesn't believe that really COVID exists and also with the different problems in the hospital like that. So I think the problem is more of the mentality of the people and the receptiveness of the concept of COVID-19 is not merely on the, you know, the problem on with the news reaching out to them. Okay. We have, maybe we will try to address um, two questions. I think it's quite related. I think it's regarding the vaccination. So I guess there's one question um, by Anonymous um, saying about um, if someone gets vaccinated, um, 
whether the person can still be exposed or there's chance for to be positive in COVID-19. I think you did address earlier, but you can um, add on to your to that response. And to follow up on that, we can maybe you can answer maybe on your personal or maybe professional knowledge about herd immunity. So vaccination doesn't Okay, I understand. <laughs> Vaccination doesn't actually doesn't actually guarantee us of hundred percent not contracting the disease because it depends on our immune system. So it yes. depends if your antibodies produced was high enough to fight off the infection, then you cannot, you know, get infected if you get vaccinated. But the problem if you don't get vaccinated is that with quality vaccines is that you don't have this process of production of antibodies in your system. So nothing triggers your immune system to produce antibodies, which is much more higher risk of contracting the disease easily. So I think that's it. So I cannot guarantee 100% that you don't get infected if you get vaccinated. I cannot also guarantee that the vaccine will work for you. But being vaccinated is more of an additional measure for you to get, you know, to passively lowering the chance for you to get infected if your immune system develops the antibodies enough to combat the disease. So would you think that if everyone in the community or everyone in the country gets vaccinated, do you think it's enough? to be to get protected against COVID-19 or is it because of what you said because it depends on the response from each individual's um, internal system whether how do they react to the vaccine so so what's your take on that is it enough or um, vaccination and on top of other existing measures need to be in place for a longer time at least for now I think if they get vaccinated with the proper vaccines and good vaccines, good quality vaccines, then we can actually, you know, limit the number of infections in the community. But I'm not pretty sure as to they have to get vaccinated. I cannot actually answer because this is actually a personal stand. So it's up yeah. to you if you want to get vaccinated or not. But for me, on my personal point of view, I think if you get vaccinated, it will you know, because the process of vaccination actually places the messenger RNA in your body to produce the antibodies. So if you get exposed to the messenger RNA, which is not actually the live attenuated virus. So if you get exposed to the messenger RNA, which is just a fragment of the virus, your body produces the antibodies. So that antibodies will combat. If, 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 if COVID will enter into your system, then that antibodies will combat, if you have developed that, that but antibodies will combat the virus which will enter, enter your system, just the COVID, okay? So I am, not, uh, I am not discouraging or encouraging vaccinations for now, but on my personal stand, it would be better if, if we get vaccinated with good and quality vaccines, if we want to, you know, to limit the infections. Because we cannot actually limit the exposure since no man is an island. That's the first thing. We are a social you know, individual and we cannot live with ourselves or you know, alone. Yeah, and I think we are still like globally, we are still new in terms of vaccination. So in terms of the in terms of the yeah, there are test results about 95% um, uh, good result, but I think we are still early into knowing how. Number one is how effective they are, really effective they are. And number two is about how fast the rate of vaccination across all countries, especially the uh, hard to reach areas like developing countries. Yeah, they will take some time. Actually, the most, yeah, actually the most important thing in this pandemic is for you to maintain the minimum safety protocols, which is to number one, keep physical distancing. Hmm. Number two is wear your masks. And number three, frequently do high hand hygiene. So that's the three most essential thing. If you don't want to get vaccinated, then you have to observe those safety protocols for you not to contract the disease. Or uh, maybe with vaccination, these three measures will still be compulsory. So maybe 
Um, yeah, maybe yeah. the government or the government of each country would want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. After vaccination, you still have to to do the yeah. safety protocols. <laughs> yeah. Because it's not percent assured that you have developed the immunity already. Yes, it is a long journey. Yeah. So only time will tell. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> I guess the next question, I guess is, maybe it's a general question, but maybe you as a medical technologist can shed some light on this. So we know that um, some who has COVID display symptoms, so um, some do not. So it's kind of like uncertain. So I guess that's the very, that's the um, scary or uncertain nature of this COVID-19 virus. Actually, the reason why some develop some symptoms and others do, does not, because this virus is not fully studied yet, actually. It still continues to mutate, it still continues to affect and to infect different forms of organisms. Like if you have heard about Denmark, the meats were infected with, with, with COVID, and then there's this evolution of the B117, the E484K, the 501v.2. So this is actually still a long way to go because it's not yet fully studied. It's not yet fully understood mm -hmm. on the mechanism mm -hmm. and everything. So what we should do is to protect ourselves from getting infected because who knows that this infection can actually be registered by, by you know, by a certain memory cell in our body and can be detected over time or maybe like that. So I think the most important thing is to, you know, to protect yourself from getting infected. And also most of those who develop severe symptoms are those with comorbidity, like uh, hypertension, diabetes, cancers, those that are immunocompromised, mostly the children and then mm. the older ones, the older generations. So we have to also to protect them as much as we can. Okay. Because we don't know the mechanism of this virus yet to our body. Yeah. We don't yeah. fully know yet the mechanism. So sometimes the symptoms is actually based on the health status of the patient. And we also heard in the past few months there's a new variant about it. So that's something that we just the world just discovered like after like more than half a month of like the pandemic. So it's I think it's a lot of effort needs to be done. Just study alone and to study maybe what is very complex to understand, maybe. Yeah, yeah that's true. It's very complex to understand. So we are keeping track of time. I think we are well on time. Yeah. So we are two minutes to 30, but I think we will just finish off the remaining questions. So um, I guess the next question also based on your professional or scientific um scientific knowledge so like this uh person was asking like upon the exposure to the virus how many days does it take before the person can infect to others so i guess maybe this person is immune to the because i know correct me if i if i'm wrong this like if the person is got the virus but is doesn't get covid he or she can pass to someone else. Am I right to see that? So in terms of number of days, yeah, actually, actually, it depends on the person's internal system. Yeah. But mostly on an average, it takes five to seven days after the first exposure. So that's the reason why if you get exposed, you get tested after seven days. So because that is the best fit for the uh, laboratory to detect the virus. So if you get exposed to a positive patient, then you have to isolate yourself for at least five to seven days, and then you get tested after seven days, and then but that seven days that's not that's not actually assure that you didn't really get the virus. So so you have to keep still the safety protocols, the minimum safety protocols, even inside home, <laughs> especially yeah. if you go outside for work, you know, because. For the B117 or the UK variant, it's 70% more transmissible and infectious as compared to the old variant. So it's better to be safe than sorry. <laughs> but usually it's five to seven days on an average. Yeah. 
I mean, it's regardless of how many days I guess the best is to protect yourself so that you can protect others. So the about safe distancing, good hygiene, wearing a mask, I think even if someone has COVID, he can prevent someone else yeah. to get it. So I guess that's how the measures, the safety just, measures, good hygiene will protect in different ways. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to answer Pick Bang Day. Yeah, I saw that. Yes, it's available in my social media and my Facebook account. My Facebook account is Marlon Dos if you'd like to see it. It's in yeah. public. So you can view the video. Yeah, maybe after this session, you can, Marlon can type your Facebook um, username name on the chat so everyone can like be your followers yeah. and be your it's and Marlon, inspire more Marlon people. Dos. <laughs> yeah, it's Marlon Dos D O S. Okay, so maybe we end off with, maybe uh, I'm not sure whether it's a difficult question. So like, you mentioned about good quality vaccines, like, do you know which vaccine that works the best or is too early or still very complex to answer as of now? I don't know, maybe you're inside, you're scientifically, you kind of like understand better than the rest of us, yeah? Yeah, that is a very sensitive question. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, no, 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 I, I cannot answer it directly, but I guess it's up to you or, you know, you can actually seek for professional help with medical professionals if what they'd like to recommend for vaccination, because, you know, it's hard to say things that is out of my you know, knowledge, because though I have read all the, the possible you know, and available vaccines, but I cannot, you know, give a comment on it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think well we are just okay, we are quite well on time. Now. So yeah, that's all we have for this evening's global webinar series. On behalf of SCSS, thank you, Marlon, for your presence and sharing this evening. And thank you to all of you for your time. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.